Together, our prayer for this day. Let us pray. God of life, for this new day we give thanks. May we bear witness to the gift of life in all we say and do, from the flowers that bloom to the critters that creep, from the friends we seek out to the strangers we encounter. As the birds sing out their praises, May we too make a joyful noise. May our words and our actions reveal your good news. Help us to be inspired and awed by your extraordinary creation. Amen. It is good to be together. And we give thanks for this Lord's Day as we gather in this sacred space of the Shallowford community, grateful for those that are with us and for those that are sharing with us online. Uh, we are entering our stewardship season uh, today, so we have what we would traditionally call our stewardship kickoff. There are uh, envelopes available for you as you leave that should have your name on that. Make sure to pick those up if you would, otherwise we'll need to spend the cost of a first-class stamp to drop those in the mail for it to chase you down uh, this next week. We are fast approaching the end of our lectionary year. Uh, next Sunday is Christ the King Sunday, and that is always the, the, the grand finale of a lectionary cycle. We have our jazz service planned for that, so it will be quite celebratory, and we give thanks for that. Make sure to notice the uh, pictures out in the gathering space that celebrate uh, everything that's going on here in the life of this community as we, as we gather together and, and remind ourselves of that goodness in, in the weeks to come. Tom, um, is, you want to say something? Yes. 
So Jeff already mentioned the jazz service next Sunday, and please tell friends and bring them along. And I do have a few of these little flyers <clears throat> in the welcoming space if anybody has a place where you could put one up uh, to let people know. And then also, sadly, Tom Carlton has a sore throat this morning, so he won't be singing the offertory <laughs> that's in our God to Worship, but we've been intending this for this day as we begin our stewardship season. So enjoy the prayer that's by George Herbert that's printed in your bulletin, and imagine Tom singing it, and then he'll sing it again soon. <laughs> Thanks. We do have a, a properly announced uh, congregational meeting after our worship time, so I ask you to stay for that brief time of electing officers and the 2023 nominating committee, so we'll attend to that order of business after the service. Other announcements? To that. I have a prayer that I want to share at this time before we have our passing of the peace. Um, this was written by Jill Duffield when she was serving as an editor at the Presbyterian Outlook and, um, and was written just as a reminder for the Veterans Day that we celebrated on Friday and for um, uh, a time of remembrance for us as we gather. So let us pray. Lord of all, you long for a time when all nations will be ruled with justice and a world where everyone lives in safety and harmony. And until that time when swords are beaten into plowshares and the wolf and the lamb eat together, we will give thanks for the veterans who have served their country with honor and with courage. We will remember the sacrifices made by members of the military and their families. We know that they have endured long seasons apart from loved ones. The disruption of moves and deployments, the stress of being sent to regions that are engulfed by violence, the repercussions of physical and spiritual and moral injuries. Where the pain of those injuries persist, we pray you bring healing. Where the memories of that trauma are harrowing, we pray that you grant relief. Where the grief of those losses threaten to overwhelm, we pray that you grant hope. We ask for these blessings upon veterans and those closest to them that they may know the gift of your presence and the peace that you promise that passes all understanding. Thanks be to you, O God. Amen. As we gather each Lord's Day, we gather and remind ourselves that we come together around this table and around the very presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I remind you then that as we gather in the name of Jesus Christ to share the peace of Christ with each other.
Let us pray our prayer for new beginnings uh, in unison. Let us pray together. Holy God, you have commanded us to not be afraid and assured us of your presence. In the midst of trials and joys, sorrows and dreams, may we know your presence and rejoice. Grant us courage, O oh God, to take delight in your spirit in all times and all places. Grant us faith, O oh God, to see the near ways you give life. Grant us hope, O oh God, to participate in your work in the world. Grant us love, O oh God, to walk our response and your compassion. And all that we say and do. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Let us pray for illumination, understanding, and light. Let us pray. God of wisdom, by your Spirit, may your word be proclaimed, that we may know good news in our hearts and minds, and bear witness to the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ in word and deed. Quiet in us any voice but your own, that we might hear your word to us this day. Amen. A few words before Stuart reads this visionary, iconic passage out of the book of Isaiah that's been foundational for this church and many other churches as we dream new dreams. The chapters that precede our iconic Isaiah passage for this Lord's Day, they're really one long scribed lament because times are very, very hard. Life is just so difficult. The community struggles are so overwhelming that there is real danger that the people of God will fall off of a spiritual cliff. They are on the edge of losing their core identity as the people of God by ascribing their setbacks to the communities, um, not to the community's unfaithfulness, but to this just ghastly indifference of God. And so the prophet stands on the edge of this precarious cliff and is on a quest to keep God's word of promise hope alive and hopeful for the people of God. In chapter 65, which precedes our verses for the day, we start in verse 17. The beginning of that chapter starts with what we might name as a come to Jesus meeting. One of those support group AA moments when it is time to take that extremely hard look in the mirror, to be able to dig through the greatest of hurdles, the dragon of denial. Israel must face the music, the long chapters of lament that want to point the finger at an indifferent God that seems to have abandoned them is not the root cause of their struggles. The problem is not God's indifference, they can no longer deny their role in the crisis. The roadmap to wholeness and health begins with the very first step, which is an honest confession of responsibility. The crisis is not the fault of God that has forgotten them. It is the people's rebellion that have caused the nation to stumble and to fall. And so chapter 65 opens with the holy speaking truth to the crisis situation in which the struggling community finds itself. God says, I was ready to be sought out by those who did not ask, to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, 
Here I am, here I am, to a nation that did not call on my name. I held out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices. I think that last line is just a real eye-opener. A people who walk in a way that is just not good, following their own devices. And so the prophet speaks up for God and says, listen up and just look hard in the mirror, people of God. This well-worn path that you walk is not good. You are following your own devices. You have closed your consciousness and your awareness to the holy. And your well-worn path has led to brokenness. Your own devices have hidden God's face from you. The people of God were falling into a captivity that was probably far more destructive than any foreign power. Without this awareness, without this presence of the holy in their lives, they were lost. And so the prophet stands on this edge of a spiritual cliff where the people are just teetering so dangerously close to falling off and calls for a change of direction. A course change. Theologically, we call that repentance when we turn and veer in a different direction. And repentance starts with this good, hard look in the mirror. A good self-examination. An honest assessment that will peel off the layers of denial and be able to get real about what's happening. I remember from my class on addictions years ago at Columbia Seminary, it's about the art, only thing I remember, is that the hardest nut to crack, to open up, is that hard work of breaking through denial. It's the first step and the hardest step. We are just champions of denial. We walk in a way that is not good, always. And the prophet reminds us that we often follow our own devices and repenting and turning from that well-trod path, well, that's really serious work. And perhaps for today, it might be easier for us to consider the larger context, easier than looking too closely in the mirror just at ourselves. We might place ourselves in the global setting of humanity. We might try to take an honest look at the species of Homo sapiens, the species to which all of us as human beings belong. Homeo sapiens, which, at least in the way we have lived out, is like an oxymoron. In Latin, that means wise man. We might ask ourselves, oh Lord, as Homeo sapiens, what have we done? We are destroying this wonderful creation. We have plundered and plucked and eradicated countless creatures into extinction. We have cut down our magnificent forest and we have polluted our magical waters and we have brought the horrors of war to the lives of so many. We have divided ourselves in so many ways and built walls and borders. We have dramatically emphasized all of the differences and forgotten that we are one. We have set up political systems that allow the few to gain economically while the many suffer. We stand at the edge of the cliff we are so close to falling into the abyss, into the destruction of our own making. The prophet stands on the edge of this same cliff centuries ago, where the people are just about to fall over and fall in, and calls for this change of course, this course change, this repentance, this turning, and utters this wild, this incredible, amazing new vision. This path to lean into that we can walk boldly in that returns and reconnects us and reminds us of what we are intended to be. So hear God's words of hope for the Hebrew people centuries ago as well as for us today. 
Isaiah writes, For I am about to create a new heaven and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and his people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall be build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant for another to eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be. And my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity. For they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will, will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. But the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. And so the prophet paints this magnificent vision of a, a new heaven and a new earth, this, this way forward where the people walk hand in hand with God, intertwined and aware, where hope flourishes and where dreams can be rebirthed and where the restoration of all of God's creation to its intended wholeness will be visible on the horizon and no more shall the sound of weeping be heard or the cry of distress. We shall build houses and inhabit them, plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Children will not be born to go off to war. We will be so close to the holy that before we can even speak, God will answer. While we are yet speaking, God will hear. In this wonderful image of those we deem the most unlikely to get along, the, the wolf and the lamb, they will be feeding together. They will not hurt or destroy on my holy mountain, says the Lord. This is the way, the prophet says, and we do not doubt that this is possible because this is within the capacity of God and within the capacity of the people of God. Strangely enough, the word that percolated up for me this week from this reading was a word that I had never associated with this text, and that was capacity. It's the word that I would like for you to focus on this first Sunday in our stewardship emphasis season. One little word, capacity. The prophet lifts our hearts and minds to contemplate the capacity of God. The prophet says God has the capacity to create on an unimaginable scale. New heavens and new earth is within the capacity of the one we worship. In all of creation, in all that we might imagine beyond creation, God has the capacity to bring new life into any circumstance. You know, it's been a rather strange week for me because, uh, and I'm sure it's just me, but sometimes my mind just wanders all over the place and I get fixated on an old movie. 
And often it's an old movie that I haven't watched for years and years, could even be decades and decades. Sometimes I have to struggle to remember the name or who was in the movie. And I really got fixated on a movie this week. I started remembering scenes from a movie as if I had just watched it that night when it had been quite a time. The movie was the right stuff. Tom Hanks classic, telling the tale of Apollo 13's mission. The understated words that kind of define the movie Houston, we have a problem, was embedded in the movie. And the first scene that kept flashing through my head again and again this week was when Tom Hanks, who's playing Jim Lovell, the kind of the lead astronaut for the mission, has this to say. Well, well, Hank says, I'll tell you, I remember this one time. I'm in a banshee at night, and I'm in combat conditions, and so there's no running lights on the carrier, and it was the Shangri-La, and we were in the Sea of Japan, and my radar was jammed, and my homing signal was gone because somebody in Japan was actually using the same frequency. And so it was. It was leading me away from where I was supposed to be. And I'm, I'm looking down at this big black ocean, so I, I flip on my map light. And then suddenly, zap! Everything shorts out right there in the cockpit. All my instruments are gone, and my lights are gone, and I can't even tell what altitude I'm at. I know I'm running out of fuel, so I'm thinking about ditching in the ocean. And I look down there, and there in the darkness, there's, there's this green trail. It's like a long carpet that's just laid out right beneath me. And it was the algae, right? It was that big phosphorescent stuff that gets churned up in the wake of a big ship. And it was, it was just leading me home. You know, if my, if my cockpit lights hadn't shorted out, there's just... Nowhere I'd ever be able to see that. So you just, you just, you just never know. Lovell stumbles and says, you never know what events are to transpire to get you home. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The prophet speaks of walking together with an awareness as God intended for us, where the common good will be embraced and where things that the prophet speaks about, things that are dear to our heart, like health care and education and safe neighborhoods and plentiful good water and environmental stewardship. These, the prophet says, these are the intended will and the intended way in the future that God would have for us. And you never know what events are to transpire to actually get you home. Capacity is a foundational word in the, in the world of professional funds development. There are established procedures for measuring capacity in a community like ours. We, we call them read, readiness studies or feasibility studies. And um, we look at all the data that is available to us, the, the number of giving units and the history of our giving and the expected changes that might impact our giving. And we assess and we applaud plot along in our Excel sheets, all of that data. And if we take a hard look at our Shalliford financial data like that, it is not a comforting look. Despite the gracious generosity of many of you, the numbers just do not match up for the year 2023. We face significant financial challenges as a community. It seems beyond our communal capacity to meet those challenges, it might be fair to say we stand on a rather precarious financial cliff. I was reminded of and flashed back to another iconic scene. I have three for you, so I'll just <laughs> one, one more after this. So, in, in the movie again, in the right stuff, you know, Houston is where NASA control is at, and the flight director, Gene Krantz, is, is, in, is in Houston, things are getting quite serious. They just don't think they're gonna be able to get Apollo 13 back. And two of his directors are discussing the low survival chances for the crippled spacecraft. And one of them says to the other, I know what the problems are, Henry. And the other says, this could be the worst disaster that NASA has ever experienced. 
And Krantz turns to him as he's kind of getting his tie all cinched up and he says, with all due respect, sir, I believe that this is going to be our finest hour. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not even be remembered or come to mind. Rejoice and be glad. I will create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. Reminds us that all things shall be well, as Julian of Norwich says, and that with God, all things are possible, as Mother Teresa would tell her elders with one penny and miles and miles to go for the needs of Calcutta. Last, this is my favorite scene. I saved the last for you from my favorite character of the movie. And thankful for you, it's the last to share for the day. So Marilyn Lovell, the wife of astronaut Jim Lovell, she visits the care facility where Jim's mother is residing in, and she's trying to comfort the mother as, as it seems impossible that Apollo 13 will be able to safely return to Earth. And Marilyn, Marilyn comes into the facility and says, Blanche, Blanche, these nice young men are going to watch the television with you as they gather around the TV to watch the news. This is Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. And Blanche says, are you boys in the space program too? <laughs> and just when you think that Blanche is just some dotty old woman, she turns over to Marilyn and says, Marilyn, are you scared? And Marilyn nods her head and holds back the tears. Well, Blanche's face just lights up. It is just transformed. And she turns to Marilyn and says, well, don't you worry, honey. If they could get a washing machine to fly, my Jimmy could land it. <laughs> this prophet Isaiah, spoken centuries ago, invites us to live into the capacity that we are born with, the sacred children that we are, invites us to lean into this vision of a new tomorrow, to believe and become aware of the holy that surrounds us in all living matter. God says, before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. Thanks be to God this day. In Christ's name, amen.
our prayers of intercession. Holy God, your loving kindness knows no ending. Out of the depths of slavery, you heard the cry of your people and responded with liberation. Hear us from the depths of our captivity. For your people held captive by addictions that ravage body, mind, and spirit, we affirm. Your spirit abides among us, and we will not fear. For your people held captive by violence, abuse, and exploitation, we attest. Your spirit abides among us, and we will not fear. For your people held captive by illness, weakness, and vulnerability, we recall. Your spirit abides among us and we will not fear. For your people held captive by economic or vocational poverty, we proclaim, your spirit abides among us and we will not fear. Holy God, your loving kindness knows no ending. Hear our prayers and keep us mindful until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. A prayer of thanksgiving and dedication for our offerings, those received here and those received online. Let us pray. For the gifts offered this day and every day, we give thanks, O God. Make us good stewards of all you have entrusted to our care. May these gifts be used to serve your beloved creation, to sustain your children in all they say and do, and to build up your kingdom throughout the earth. Amen.
Just a reminder that uh, we do have your stewardship envelopes ready for you. Maybe if Jackie and Mike could try to find those. I know Christine worked on those on behalf of the session this week. Your time and talent card expanded to a whole eight and a half by 11 time and talent sheet. So take some time with that. Um, folks work diligently to try to consider the task that, um, that we have committed to in, in our mission and our work ahead and prayerfully consider that along with your financial giving. And remember that we'll have a brief time with our uh, congregational meeting after the blessing. So go into the world in peace and bear witness to the God that is present in all living matter and bless God's holy name forever and ever, giving thanks in all things. Amen. Amen.